Welcome everybody to Fridays on the Farm. Uh, this series is a collaboration event between the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition, University of Minnesota Extension, and the Minnesota NRCS, as well as the Renville and Redwood Soil and Water Conservation Districts. Uh, my name is Taylor Becker and I'm an Extension Educator with the University of Minnesota. Today we'll be in the field with Holly Haddlewick, District Manager of the Renville County Soil Water um, Conservation District and Kristen Brennan, State Soil Health Specialist with NRCS. And um, we'll be talking with Ben Dwyer, a farmer in the Southeast Minnesota and board member and farmer mentor for the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition. The Minnesota Soil Health Coalition is a producer-driven, producer-led soil health organization offering information, support, and networking to Minnesota farmers. Today, we're going to be talking to Ben about soil health on his farm. If you have any questions during the session, please type them into the Facebook live stream and our host, Kristen, will be happy to discuss them with Ben once we get to that portion of the session. So with that, I will go ahead and pass this over to the people out in the field. Well, good morning. Welcome to our first Fridays on the Farm. I'm here in Lincoln County with Ben DeWire. Hi. So what we're gonna do today is, Ben is gonna tell us a little bit about his story. And I just wanna point out while we were waiting to get on and we appreciate you bearing with us on our debut today, uh, we were sitting over here watching him work at the gravel pit. So I just want you to have a little perspective of what kind of topography Ben is trying to farm in here with a gravel pit half mile away um, we're kind of in a little bit of rolly area so probably not um, the most productive cropland in southwest Minnesota <laughs> no, definitely not it's probably the lower third <laughs> where I'm at but that's okay you kind of piece together with that's what went well so my wife and I we kind of started our farm ourselves and that's kind of what we started with we got the sandy rockier pieces that nobody wanted to mess with and uh and they were a tremendous fit for no-till you know i mean because we needed to can we have farms where you have sandy streaks that burn off and on the top of the hill you have swamps and potholes so you can drown and burn in the same field but but we've learned to like it and we've learned to work with it and you just yeah like i said we we enjoy it but uh i guess out here we we raise um oats soybeans and corn uh the Oats and soybeans are both food grade that we raise. And then we also have cattle and a few other odd livestock around the yard, but. Awesome. So Ben, why don't you tell us um, what's happening on this field behind us? Um, here we are in July. Yep. Should we be in knee high soybeans maybe by now <laughs> yeah. or yeah. These shin high? These aren't your knock your socks off beans, but no. So, <laughs> no, I don't mean to imply yeah, that. They no. look healthy and wonderful. So the story behind it, these are double crop soybeans. These these beans are only 12 days old. I planted them last Sunday or two Sundays ago. Um, this is double crop. Uh, what, what it was was I had oats here last year that was under seeded with red clover. And then once we finished getting the straw bales off, we no-tilled triticale to here last fall. And then we cut this for hay, this, this field for, for winter feed for the cattle. And then we no-tilled the soybean. Well, we, we no-tilled the soybeans and then we came through and we, we did a burn down of uh, Roundup and Sharpen okay. on this. So. And what were you trying to target with the Roundup and the Sharpen? We were, well, we had the leftover triticale. We had a lot of foxtail from the year before, tremendous grass pressure. And then we were trying to kill the red clover which as you can see, we didn't have great success, but I think it will disappear over time. So probably didn't work the way you'd hoped. Nope. But we kind of talked about that maybe um, there's an opportunity behind yep. this. Well, like I was saying, you know, we were talking, it's like, um, first off, I think this red clover and, and a couple other fields that we did this on, it really started to flower. So I think it's gonna mature and just kind of senesce and under the canopy will just kind of just be there, but it's not gonna hurt the beans. But I was talking to a guy and I, this is just speculation, but we started wondering is like, will these extra flowering plants possibly bring in some beneficial insects when we get into aphid season in a month? I, I don't know that they will. I'm not saying that they will. It, it'll be interesting to see if it does help because I'm like, it's one more plant that might bring in some more beneficials. We'll, we'll find out, we'll know more in a month or so, but it's just a, a speculation, but 
could be a happy coincidence. It could be nothing. I don't know yet. Something interesting to watch for sure. Yeah. So how long have you been cropping this field that we're standing in today? It's about seven years. This here used to all, this was basically forest. We had a whole bunch of kind of poplar trees that were supposed to be milled for paper is what was here. Okay. So yeah, at seven years ago, we would have been with the deer and the trees, solid, solid rows of trees. So. Okay. And so we talked about the gravel, which you not only fought tree roots, but then what other, I mean, pretty rocky in this area. Pretty, pretty rocky. Yep. 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 And so I do want to point out, you know, as we talk about the topography, we pulled up this hunk of clover. Um, and, you know, just to take a look at the structure, I mean, even within the structure, we've got lots of rocks that we can see within the structure. But I want you to see how aggregated this structure is. In this top, I mean, we've got a good six inch hunk here. You've got active wormholes. We've got lots of biology, lots of things happening. But what we've got is on the side of a hill, I hope you can see the color. There's a few streaks of brown still, but really we're changing the color and the texture of this soil by increasing your organic matter. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed a change in your organic yeah, matter? Yeah, th this was very, very light colored soil when we started. And it was the kind like you'd be combining soybeans and you would see pebbles like golf balls everywhere. I mean, it was very, very, you knew when you were seeing stones all over the ground that it wasn't going to be fantastic stuff. But. Oh, look at that. We've got some biology happening right there for us as well. So just one scoop. We've got lots of worm activity. We still got lots of rocks that Ben was mentioning that he's dealing with, but the roots are finding their way through because he's building that aggregate stability and the biology is also finding its way. There he is. So hillside, we touched a little bit about yep. that, just knowing about your farm. Uh, what kind of erosion issues do you deal with? I mean, you get some pretty gravelly stuff over here. We, I, I, uh, to be honest with you, I see very, very little erosion at all. I, uh, these fields have been no-till for about, you know, since, since we started. Uh, they they kind of did a little tillage when they took the trees out. It was more like skid loaders pushing and it was packed pretty hard, but it's, sure. but no, it's, we got some pretty strong hills, but I very see very little soil erosion as far as like the big washes and stuff, you know, and we'll, I'll go to, go to Marshall and you'll drive by some of the flatter fields that, you know, very flat compared to these. Okay. And you'll see deep washes where you can't even imagine that the water could run that fast, but they can cut down a foot and a half deep at times in the yeah. spring. But no, I've, it, it, it's been really good at holding stuff together. Awesome. So, you know, what do you notice as far as yield or production? Is it pretty uniform across the field? Or are you noticing, you know, sometimes what we see with topography like this is we get a little bit of an erosion, eroded knob or somewhere that's maybe less productive on the hill. Yeah, top. yeah, a lot of times it's towards the top kind of wrapping around. The, I'm guessing just towards the top of this, they'll be, you know, they won't be quite as good. Yeah, you still have your sandy streaks. They're, they're better and they're more yeah. uniform. And you see it more probably on a corn year. You know, because you'll get corn and, you know, we, we're just used to that. We have years on a normal year where your top of your hills, your, your corn is not going to be that great. And you're lucky if the ear's not touching the ground. But at least now we're getting, we've, we've learned to pick for a really drought stress varieties also. But it's like, now we can get an ear that's at least high enough. We can get underneath it and pick it up. Sure. There's nothing worse than coming in halfway and cutting that ear in half and then watching all those yellow kernels scatter and become <laughs> next year's weed problem. Oh. <laughs> but no, it's. It, it has helped on the hilltops tremendously. It really has. Good. Stabilizing that soil infiltration wise. Have you noticed, um, you know, traffic control or just, you know, infiltration? Do you think that's changed? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, because when I, I, this field I planted, we had an inch of rain two days before I planted this one. 12 days ago. Yep. And you wouldn't be able to tell. I mean, you have good moisture. I'm not saying it's I mean, you have moisture retention because your soil is functioning yep. like a sponge, like we want it to. So that's, I mean, that's awesome. That's what the goal is, right? Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about the food grade side of things. Um, does that allow maybe for some more um, introduction of cover crops into your system just because of staggered harvest times or why the food grade side of things, I guess? Well, the main reason we went with the food grade side was for one, it, it it's something we enjoy raising, something that we know is going to go directly to people eating, but it's also kind of a niche market. It's, it's a way that we can do what we're doing. We're not a very large farm compared to a lot of other people, 
you know, about 550 acres is what I farm of cropland, but it's a way that we can get more out of our acres by doing, we can, we can do these practices, but I can, you know, we're, we're not, a lot of times the seed's a little bit cheaper, but it's like, you kind of, you're, you're cutting your input costs. And if you can get more for your output, you're kind of burning the candle on both ends in a good way, you know? So that's what our, we're trying to just bring, use, spend less and send out more value type of a deal. Yeah. Makes good sense. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned we, your wife, Christy, had yep. to go to work. She, yep. couldn't, she couldn't just hang out with us on a Friday. So um, Christy's also part of the operation. Yep, and is. you guys have some livestock yep. that you operate. Tell us about that. Yep, we have cattle that we uh, we raise grass-fed beef. Um, and we would we, we, we call management intensive grazing, where we move every single day this time of year. And uh, during, you know, you always have flexibility because life comes into play. You know, we, to be honest with you, it'd be, I could get more production if I was moving daily all year, but during planting season, I move about every four days because I need to be out. There's jobs got to be done. And when we get to fall, I'm going to move them every four days too, because I can't be spending all morning doing that when I need to be in the combine. Cause it's just Christy and I, and, and she has a full-time job. So most of harvest and stuff is just me. Okay. So that's that's a lot to balance yep but hopefully those cattle have learned to kind of just fend for themselves those four days and i'm sure yep. they got plenty of feed so so do you work the livestock into um any of your cover crop systems yeah we usually will try and graze the livestock afterwards okay. yep yep so like with the oats we'll graze the red clover afterwards so okay. so yep. um cow calf or are you doing both okay. we, yep we raise our own yep so we calve them out we do a cow calf deal and then we'll run the cattle as yearlings the next year okay which is kind of our insurance policy in case we need to get rid of some animals uh because of drought or something sure. we have some some kind of sellable class of livestock that we can get rid of nice so you've yep. really diversified in a lot of ways to yep. kind of build in resilience right yep so um when we were talking about the forage you took off of here was it just triticale to feed to the livestock or was that another marketable product potentially that you were uh the four it was it was just it was triticale and red clover that we cut for hay yep okay. so it was just for the livestock feed yep but it was kind of a way to get some good grass self it, it's kind of a, it basically it was an annual forage but it's pretty similar in quality to grass alfalfa mix okay so nice yep so um 12 days ago these soybeans were planted yep how um, I no-till no -till these in. So, yep, we took the hay off and then we no-tilled the soybeans in and then we, uh, we uh, terminated the cover crop with herbicide. Okay. So you've been no-till in seven years. Yes. Yep. Um, what are some of the benefits in no-till? Why do you choose to no-till? Uh, well, one of the benefits is it's a, it's, a, it's a large labor savings for us. You know what I mean? Being, being it's just my wife and I, um, we don't have, I don't have to make as many passes, it saves a lot of fuel and input cost type of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and uh, it's uh, also being we're on sandy lighter soil and stuff, it kind of helps conserve a lot of our moisture and helps with our soil erosion and stuff. Sure. Yep. So um, one pass for no-till, you're not doing any um, running a sulfur or anything else to sized residue, really. You're just nope, harvesting. Nope, just, and just, then... yep. The only, yep, the only tillage that we do would be the culture on the very front of the of the drill, which, okay. which, like, we don't generally speaking when I do the oats and early season stuff, we don't actually run the culture to actually lock them up. They're just there. The only time I really use the cultures anymore is for soybeans, um, sometimes to size up the, um, the corn residue so we don't get hair pinning. But for the most part, we don't really do a whole lot with the tillage okay. with them. So, and you've been doing green seeding soybeans into winter crops, winter cereals, clovers, things like that for several years. Yep. Um, is there anything? I mean, I don't want to say failures because this what you're doing is amazing. There's no failures. But has there been any lessons learned that you maybe could share with the viewers first time around? don't chew this kind of thing, or maybe think about trying something else. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, well, I guess like one, one of the, you know, like I said, it's, it's a great resource to be able to cut hay off of it first, you know, just it's, and then we can double crop. So it kind of helps cheapen your feed costs a little bit. Um, it's good to have a couple plans in play because if you cut that off and you have good moisture in the soil and then you get a really hot day, it's going to be like concrete to plant it into. And so I did have my, 
my corn planter ready to go in case I couldn't get the drill in the ground because I have had that happen where it's too too hot or too hard that I can't I just can't physically get my drill into the ground sure. and so you know it's good to be ready to the plan B um, and yeah. so what do you do for resources uh, I noticed your hat there Minnesota yep. Soil Health Coalition um, you're a board member yep and um, Maybe tell us a little bit about the coalition and why you thought it was important to be involved. Sure. Yeah. Well, like they said, that's a good reason. Um, there's a lot of things that we do. We experiment along the way, and there's a lot of things you find out. Um, for example, like the red clover not coming up, or, you know, not terminating. Um, we planted some corn. We had some trouble getting rid of the red clover, which we did figure out which herbicides to use. But it literally can cost you thousands of dollars to make the wrong choice, and it happens. You, you almost you just need to expect that you're gonna have mistakes and it's gonna happen that kind of comes with the game but if you can network with other people you might be able to avoid some of the mistakes because we don't always advertise our mistakes to people <laughs> but when you're talking it do it does come out sometimes and, and that can save a person a lot of headaches and money mm -hmm. also that support system of having somebody to talk to you know, sure. kind of prop you up and at least encourage you and, and, and bounce ideas off all that stuff too. Yeah. Just as, you know, just the friendships that come from doing that stuff. Great. So the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition is a farmer led board yep. that was organized in January of 2019. Um, so it sounds like it's a commitment though for you yep. to be on a board. I mean, this is truly something you're kind of trying to pay forward or pay back. What do you think? Oh, a little bit of, you know, like I said, it's, it's kind of one of them deals you just, you're just happy to help, but it's also, you know, it's from maybe a more selfish standpoint, there's a lot of neat people that I've gotten to meet and it's just, it's just a lot of fun. It, mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's as, I don't want to sound, but it's, it's as enjoyable for me as it is to help too. Good. Because it's, it's just, it's just a neat group of people and very optimistic even when you have these hard economic times like we're having now to find people that are still upbeat, wanting to try new things and change the paradigm of how we think a little bit. It's just kind of, it's just fun and it's uplifting. That's awesome. Well, I've been involved in several of your board meetings and they're always a positive spin on things. Even if just the last one, somebody had six inches of rain and he joined us on Zoom and he's like, well, well I'll just go do this paperwork instead today and catch up on some coalition paperwork. So it's always, um, it seems like an upbeat group and a fun organization to be yeah. part of. Good. So you've also got um, CRP that you manage. Do you also have, you know, corn that we're going to look at? Yep. So do you think this system that you're farming, do you try and target anything specific? Are you working on biology? Are you working on soil structure? Do you have a goal like that you're, or are you just trying to work with mother nature as much Mostly, as Mostly, to be honest with you, we're, we're blanket. For pro we're really just trying to work with mother nature. There's, you know, we, we've always got goals in mind. There's, there's always certain, you know, like ahead of most of my soybeans, we'll put cereal rye on. And that primarily it's gotten to be more of a weed control issue. Sure. And, you know, it's one of those things where I was talking to a guy yesterday about this and I said, you know, I've, it gets, you know, when, when money's tight going out in the fall, when you, it's like, okay, there's another 30 bucks. Do I want to spend it? But I told, you know, I was telling him, I said, I have never once spent money on a cover crop that I wish I, that I said, I wish I wouldn't have done that. But I have said, I wish I would have planted it there. I, I, I have I have done cereal rye where I'm like oh you get them spots I'm like if I have a few water hams here it's like it's where either sometimes it's a it dies out winter from kill winter pitch. kill yeah but I have I have more often than not wish that I went heavier or a thicker stand right. than I have not doing it I, you know so. so how many years have you been using cover crops <sighs> I gotta think 10 to 12 years so in 10 or 12 years, you've never had that. And you're not grazing every acre of cover crop. Actually, we haven't been grazing a ton of acres of cover crops. So pretty much, I mean, conventional cropping system without livestock across those acres. And you've never regretted what you've seeded and you are saying you wish you'd have done more sometimes. Yep. That's awesome. So, you know, with the cover crops, one thing that we often talk about is to keep in mind, there's often more activity happening beneath the soil surface than above the soil surface. And, you know, when we looked at this clover, which is a little wilty, because it is warm out here, by the way, in case you hadn't <laughs> noticed by our red faces, um, you know, it's growing back, but 
this root structure that I cut off is that or longer than what's above ground. So yep. you're really, the cover crop's working beneath the surface, even though you can't quite see it. Oh yeah. And I'm sure you've dug up, you know, cereal rye. Often we see that with cereal rye in the fall, you've got two inches above ground and six below sometimes. So you know, another thing you see from doing this, especially with the red clovers and the amount of wildlife that show up. You know what I mean? Because a lot of times you're out working and when I when I when you're doing out in these fields, it's not uncommon to see turkeys and deer and um, you know, we got a field over there that I know every night if you're out there right around towards the evening, there's a coyote that I know is gonna come from this tree to that tree. He just cuts across there. I mean, I, I'm sure. assuming he's got a watering hole or something, but it's just like yep. you know, and the other field next to us over there where I've got corn and you know, I see coyote pups out there once in a while and sure. stuff and and you know. They, they have a place that's where they're supposed to be you know what i mean they're out here with with this you're going to get more mice you're going to get more seed predation they're there to eat them right you know once in a while you hit a hole yeah with the tractor tire and you you're like dang it why did you have to put that there but <laughs> he's got to have a home so i guess that's just how it goes so yeah it's all kind of in balance yep. you had made the comment to me once that um you know maybe it's a little less pressure on your winter feed source having other food sources for wildlife yeah because the, the, we used to, the the deer in this area used to kind of where they would herd up several hundred in the winter and i live about a mile down to the south and yeah they would they would come and eat out of the hay shed a lot or the grind ground corn piles and stuff when we were feeding grain sure um and since then they kind of just stay here because there's usually green feed underneath the snow and so this this particular farm here we don't usually graze any cattle because the deer get that covered for us so sure. it's you've got a grazing herd here it's just a wild one but yeah. it's still accomplishing the same goals and i know public safety wise uh your wife made the comment to me we're right along highway 19 yep. um, about the deer staying put yep they're not crossing the highway they're just hunkering in here and so you guys have really noticed less dead deer and accidents yep. right along this stretch too you still get a few but for the most part it, it has yeah. i think it's safe a lot of windshields so soil health and cover crops are having a, a overall public safety and financial benefit that's awesome so i've got a few questions then what's your take on soil health and have you seen any so i i have actually I think they're neat i have not myself used it i, I do soil test all, all of my corn ground um, every spring, but I have not actually done any like the Haney test or any of them. So okay. that was one of our Facebook questions. So thank you people for sending in your questions. So we are at um, about the halfway mark and Ben has got another really cool site that we're going to transition over to um, just a couple hundred feet away. So I believe looking over at my tech support, we're going to just take a little brief pause while we move the camera so you don't have to watch us jiggle across the field with it. So if you want to just bear with us, Ben and I will be right back with you. All right, what's the question? Yeah, I know. We're not Well, thanks, uh, Holly and Ben and everyone. Um, just as a reminder, uh, I know Holly mentioned, uh, just a quick reminder, feel free to post any questions, comments, any thoughts. Um, we'll be happy to answer those questions um, live on Facebook.
why there's no wind towers right here. Sting site just up there. Yep. Yep. I think that's good. Tell you when. All right, welcome back to our Facebook Live premiere video. I am pretty sure I neglected to tell you who I was when we first started. So my name is Holly Hadlewick. I'm with the Renville Soil and Water Conservation District, and also a um, non-voting member of the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition. So we're here today in Lincoln County with Ben DeWire. And we're talking about Ben's operation. So Ben, we transitioned. Yep. What do we got now? Okay, this was something kind of a this is this is obviously corn that we no-tilled in, into uh, into cereal or not cereal red clover. This uh, was oats last year, and this was this was an extremely extremely thick thick stand of red clover, really thick um, that we no-tilled. Um, we're gonna just tip this down and hopefully everybody can see really how much residue Ben is describing that we're still looking at. But you can notice though, the leaves have all disappeared. I mean, there's nothing but stems like, cause this was super leafy stuff. And for the most part, the leaves have all kind of just disintegrated. But uh, like I said, it was, it's something, this was, this was planted very early June when okay. we did this. Um, cause we wanted to let the red clover get as tall as we could just trying to maximize the amount of nitrogen that it's putting down but uh we struggled getting it terminated Re we really struggled the first time we used roundup and sharpen we went real heavy on it um but the clover greened back up within five days so we ended up switching and you used a herbicide called wide match and that that did take care of it um but it is when you have that heavy of a residue mat it's really hard to get to the very bottom plants too sure but as far as um crop stress your corn looks great beautiful robust color leaf looks healthy i mean you're happy with how that turned out yeah it's like I said, and, and we we've been it's something we've been kind of playing with we are going with earlier maturity corns and we've moved our corn to the last thing planted because of the food grade issue too we want a couple of different things in play first off we want to maximize our yields on the beans and the oats so we're putting all those in first and secondly we're trying to maximize how much nitrogen we can get out of the clover so we're doing this last so when ben's talking about all that nitrogen that he's trying to get out of the clover he's talking about all these little nodules that they're building on the root structure so i don't want to call it free nitrogen right but it's maybe a little bit of sunlight harvested nitrogen a little bit of carbon that you're able to put back into your system without having to write that extra check. Yep. So straight clover. This was, this was straight red clover. Like I said, and it How was many pounds per acre. It was seven pounds we put in with the oats. Okay. And then you harvested the oats. Yep. And actually I should mention this was grazed last fall also, because this got about 30 some inches tall and we ran 70 pairs on this 70 acre field for about my brother bought his, he runs a pasture to the east here. And he ran 70 pairs over here for about a month or so. Okay. So we actually did graze just because he had a lot of volunteer oats too sure. and stuff. And then we didn't, because it was harvest, we didn't daily move them, but Tony sectioned it off and probably about every five days with poly wire sure. we'll moved them across. So yeah, we did actually get a grazing off of this too. So, so it, oats crop off of it, grazing, a little bit of reduced cost nitrogen yep. inputs. And now you're able to take your corn yep. crop. And, and it's one of them deals, like I said, you know, it's, if you look at the, the corn, it is there's some patchy spots because where the, where this red clover died, the corn is almost two leaf stages ahead of it, just because of the thick mat that it had to come through. Sure. Um, but this time of year, when you drive by and everybody else is shoulder high and, and, and like, oh, cool, you know, but um, it, it will catch up and it'll be good. And at the end of the day, we'll be happy with it. it, it it's, it's good corn. The stand is nice. I, I'm happy with the stand all in all. Um, it's going to be good corn. It's just, it's just a baby compared to the rest of them, but they do catch up and, and so. 
your wife made the comment that you guys have had to have thick skin. So if people <laughs> drive by and wonder why your corn is short, you're maybe okay with that. Because we are on the state highway, this <laughs> field, so everybody can see it. So Yep. No, I, it's, and like you said, you're really focusing on those food grade crops yep. as your primary. And obviously you want this to be a success too, but it makes sense that you're, you know, putting efforts where you're putting efforts. So. You know, and I listening to some, some useful podcasts, um, I've learned some things since we've done this. Um, I, I listened to one guy was saying, he goes, it's really beneficial to the corn to get that cover crop down to the ground to probably roll it it gets a little bit lanky and spindly when it's coming up. And we, I did see that. I heard that like two weeks after I planted it and I'm like, shoot, would have yeah. been cool to know, but you know, it's, it's just how it goes. Yep. But. Lesson learned. So you have a Facebook question coming in. Yep. So this is 32,000. Is the population on this yep. that we're talking about. Yep. Okay. And Okay, so when I did say it was earlier, this is actually 98 day corn in here okay. because I had seed left over from last year that I had. It's got to, it had to get it in the ground. Yeah. Everything else I planted this year was 92 day corn that was planted at the same because I've got, I've got a couple fields like this. So this one is actually 98, but 92 days is what we're kind of targeting, 92 to 94. Okay, so I think we have another Facebook question. Yes, oh. actually, this was just side dressed last Saturday. We put 90 pounds of N and and the cover crop was broadcast with it also. Okay. So, yep. Two more questions coming in, it looks like. So are you taking a credit for the cover crops that you're putting out here? Yeah. The, or any other format? Yeah, the plan, I did, I, I lowered my nitrogen this year that we normally put on, not as much as I could. We're kind of hoping for about 70 to 75 pounds of nitrogen credit, but I, I'm not hundred. We'll see how that plays out. So mm -hmm. I, I probably lowered it down more like 30 or 40 pounds from what I would normally do. Sure. Um, but so we are kind of planning on a little bit. We're going to do some late season nitrate testing just to kind of see how much came in later. But um, yeah, so that's kind of what, that's what we're doing. And as far as the nitrogen with the, with the oats as a cover crop or the clover, we, we don't really, that we just let it do its own thing. Sure. It's, it's on its own. And just scavenging basically is what it's doing. Sure. Question? Awesome. So planting through the red clover was awesome. It was the funnest thing I've ever planted into. It laid- The it, funnest like, thing ever. That's awesome. It, it, I'm, not, I'm not being that sarcastic. No, it, I laid, so. it laid down flat and it looked like I came through with the steamroller, but it did pop up like yeah. the next day. But- it is, I've done a lot of green planting into cereal yep. rye that's tall and the thicker the red clover, the funner it is because it just, it lays down and it was, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. No issues getting caught up on the planter nope. or anything. I pulled my roll cleaners off. Sure. I was going to do the roll cleaners to slide it out of the way, but I'm like, you know what? That's just going to cause weed pressure. So we, I actually, I, I put them on, I had them off, I put them on and then I changed my mind and took them back off the day before I started planting corn because I'm like, no, I don't want them out there. Yeah. Yeah, so I no, and I've got spiked closing wheels and I didn't have any issue with anything wrapping ever. Awesome. Another question. Nope. So no, it's 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 gonna be harvested for grain. For grain. And and I should this is all conventional corn, by the way. Okay. Which which is another layer aspect that's a little trickier because I can't come through and clean it up with Roundup. So that takes a lot of options away. So yeah, we sure. do our corn is all conventional corn that we raise also. All right. Well, I think that's it for our questions for now anyway. So, so that was the gravel pit we talked about a little bit earlier, your challenges in this area, yep. that maybe there's a reason between the rocks and the gravel pit why you're choosing to no-till. Yeah. Any barriers with no-till corn? Often when people are talking about maybe transitioning, um, no-till corn can be a little bit intimidating. Maybe not the funnest thing they've ever planted. So what do you think? Honestly, I was a little nervous at first, but to be honest, as far as planting goes itself, you know, nutrition management takes a little more thinking. But as far as just the physical act of planting, if, if your corn planter can go through bean stubble easy, if you can get through corn stalks, bean stubble is a breeze. It's very, very simple to get through. Most planters with very little extra stuff should be able to get through it. So with your... Um edibles and small grain, you really have an opportunity to add diverse cover crops into your system, mm -hmm. kind of as a second crop or a forage crop. 
Are you doing any in-season interseeding? Um, I know you've got a little interseeding going on with those oats. Yep. So yeah, it's kind of gone to now where this corn crop has become my most intensive cover crop that, or crop that we have mm -hmm. because it has the red clover before we plant. And then when we side dress nitrogen, we, we broadcast cover crop benefits. So we have some rape, uh, radishes, crimson clover, annual ryegrass, and I think there was even some flax. And new this year, we threw in two pounds of buckwheat on all of the corn, just trying to get some beneficial insects closer to the bean acres yep. and just to add some diversity. Yeah. And then this will get no till with, with cereal rye afterwards. So this was at almost see three cover crops in the season. Wow. So you're keeping that soil armored. Yep. You're feeding your biology, just keeping moving and living. Yep. So that's what we're trying to do anyway. That's awesome. I would say you're succeeding. Tell us about your oats and the clover underneath that. Can you give us a little bit more information about that? Because I find that really interesting. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's actually a really, really, really old practice. That used to be how they had it before they could purchase nitrogen. They would use their legumes to, you know, sure. that's how they would. Yeah. They weren't asking 200 bushels out of corn back then either. <laughs> but I mean, I'm just saying it's, it's a practice that they used. Yeah. So we just, I just actually, we just mix it with the seed when we plant the oats. And it gets, you know, maybe an inch or so tall. It just sits under there. It doesn't really do anything until the oats are harvested. Sure. And once the oats come off, it greens up. And within 45 days, you're probably knee deep in the red clover. And then you could come in and plant corn into it the next year. Yep. And, and a lot of guys will do instead of, I, this is medium red clover here. A lot of guys will just do an annual red clover. So it'll winter kill, which sure. after the struggle we had, might not be the dumbest thing to consider too, uh -huh. you know. Do you think you would have gotten the same growth though with an annual clover out here? Instead? I think last fall we would have gotten the same growth. I sure. think, and obviously the spring we went up. And, and so part of the reason, um, instead of we went with the red clover too, instead of doing, I was just no-tilling a cover crop mix in after, after oat harvest. The last two years, oat harvest lasted into the middle of September and it was wet. And like the year before I planted my cover crop, came up, got about an inch tall. It was peas, oats, and radishes. And it came up, got about an inch tall. We got a killing frost and that was the end of it right there. So I'm like, all right, let's at least, now I know I got something out there. Mm -hmm. If it's wet and I can't get out there, at least, at least I got a cover crop growing. That being said, if you get a lot of rain and you have your, it'll grow into your oats after a while if it gets down there. So, I mean, there are some, it's, it's not all easy, but I mean, there are some management things that come up with it but for the most part i've been pretty happy with it and how many years have you been using that system with the this clover? will be probably our third year of doing that okay. that's awesome that's really exciting that you're doing all of those diverse things do you find that that's creating you know often we're talking about the stress around farming right now which it's always been a stressful job but <laughs> just in kind of the economic times that farmers have seen the last couple of years it's there's more struggles potentially. Yep. Do you find your diversity of having, you know, potential to graze some livestock, harvesting in different windows, has that changed your lifestyle for you and your family, reduced stress, about the same? What are your thoughts? I think it's reduced some, I and even just even just having a diversity of crop species, you know, that you're raising. With corn and beans, you've got two warm seasons. At least with oats, I've got a cool season. And ideally, I would love to have another cool season, you know, like a like a pea or something. Because if you get a bad year for the warm seasons, chances are your cool season, someone's going to win. They're not all going to get, sure. you know, unless the Mother Nature hails on you. But. Right. So we have another question coming in. So do you worry, um, you know, in this area, you've, we've been getting significant rainfalls the last few years. Do you worry about it robbing moisture from your cash crop, that cover crop? I, I haven't. No, I have. It's not been a real big issue for me, to be honest with you. Um, probably a bigger issue is getting the cover crop started when you have a lot of residue. Sure. You have a lot of residue, especially if you're broadcasting seed, you're going to want a pretty good rain to work that seed down to soil level. It gets a little more challenging to get a good, put the sure. broadcast on there. But okay. no, actually, you know, this, well, I guess when this corn started, the cereal or the red clover did suck a lot of water out of this field. And so we did have some issues where it's thicker here getting it started. So sure. it, it can happen. But for the most part, it seems to come through it okay. So, okay. I think that was it for our questions for now. Okay. So, 
when did you do your side dressing out here in your yep so it would have been it would have been last saturday okay and it was it was treated with a inhibitor too oh sure even though we did i was fortunate enough we got about three three tenths okay so we got three tenths of an inch of rain here other side of that hill we got an inch and a half there's a ridge that runs through there and this was the it ran through this there's a river valley there and it was a dividing line right there so part of the field got a good rain and this one got a little because we but, can see the top of the wind turbine just on the other yep. side of that hill where they got more rain than you did that's interesting so, but it was something was enough to get it started at least yep no. so even within your field you might have two you know and i know rain varies but that's interesting that just in one field you could have that much difference from one end to the yeah. other yeah it, and, and we see that here a lot there there's a uh, it's the south branch of the Yellow Medicine River runs just to the south of us, and there's this this ridge runs through several of my farms, and this ridge is the dividing line between a lot of different weather fronts. We, we see it a lot either side of it. Huh. Uh, a couple of years back, we had a hailstorm come through, and that's where it ran through. It wiped out this half and left me in that corner down there. Wow. That's just the upside. Left, <laughs> left me half. something. Yep. I guess uh, if there is an upside to a hailstorm, but <laughs> it actually turned out so. fine. Good. I mean, it came back pretty good. So, so then maybe that hailstorm gave you an opportunity to try some other sort of cover crops or something yeah. too that you hadn't yep. considered yet. So, do you find, um, you know, being a Minnesota Soil Health Coalition board member, do you find that um, there's educational benefits for you, whether it's being a board member or just being a member of that organization, to learn from other farmers throughout the state and the region? Yeah, I, I learned so much from a lot of the guys, even even just simple things, you know, one of the guys, Jamie Labatt, one of the fellow board members, I talk to him all the time. And sometimes it's like, hey, I don't know if my cereal rice is dying like it's supposed to. What herbicide did you use on yours, you know, or what rate did you use and yeah. stuff like that? Or even, you know, we just, we're bouncing ideas off each other. You know, we, I talked to several of the board members several times a week and we're constantly bouncing ideas off each other and well and i know you've become a resource for farmers throughout the state because i've talked to other farmers outside of lincoln county that know your name recognize your name have used you as a resource so that's one great thing that the minnesota soil health coalition can provide is that not just mentorship but relationship building and even just that sounding board mm -hmm. um, for people to go it's kind of meant to be just that hub for education um not a lot of gimmicks 25 bucks a year is your membership pretty yep. inexpensive i think you had said thousands of dollars worth of mistakes yeah maybe if you save one of those 25 bucks easy is pretty yep. easy even yeah even just just having that support group let alone the money and savings of there just having somebody you can talk to who's you know who maybe got similar goals to what you're trying to do instead of the normal people are like that's just dumb just till it up <laughs> You know, yep. just having somebody you can talk to that can, that's like, hey, yeah, maybe try this, you know, or yep. something, or hey, that's cool, keep doing that, or something. So. That's awesome. That's really good to hear. Um, I know your role on the board has been beneficial. We've got a school coming up here in September that you're going to be helping us with uh, in Marshall, September 11th, 10th and 11th. We'll be doing the first school. So I think that's going to be a really good opportunity for more farmers to yep. get connected to so the region, too. too. So that's awesome. So, we're running low on time here. What would you say is your favorite thing about this cropping season? What's the thing you're the most proud of for this year that you could share with us? Well, I don't know. Um, the, my, the oats look really nice this year. You know what I mean? It's like, we're kind of, we're, we're starting to get that one figured out a little bit better and uh, learning how to, because, you know, with having the red clover underneath it, there's certain herbicides you can't use, but we're starting to kind of get that dialed in a little bit more. And uh, it's just, it's nice. It's it's something I look forward to, and it's fun to get out and take the combine out in August and run through a few acres. Mm -hmm. So that way, when you get into the fall, you either know if you have a problem with something, if you yeah. hear a funny noise, or you're ready, you know, ready to go. So it's kind of nice to get some of the bugs worked out. Yeah. We have another question from Facebook, it looks like. So Ben, you're a farmer mentor with the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition. Yep. What is your role as a farmer mentor? Kind of just to be a sounding board. If somebody has a question, you know, um, if you go on the website and look, you can kind of sort through and it'll tell you where somebody might have some areas of experience 
through different cropping systems or livestock. So it's just more of a being open to people calling you and asking questions and being willing to share what you've learned. And you know, you, you always try and give the best information you can. It's not saying we're not wrong. You know, everybody is, but you, you know, it just open and honest and try and help people as much as you can. You made a comment that once um, you also seem to learn from people that you visit with too. So do you think being a mentor has been mutually beneficial or is it more just you always having to give? give oh yeah. Give? I mean, I've, I've talked to a few guys that are trying some different things that I've never thought of. Yeah. And uh, I'm very anxious to check back with them later in the season, just to see how some of those things worked, you know, yeah. things that to me, I was like, Oh, I never thought about that. It's kind of intriguing. Mm -hmm. So, so it's kind of a, a win-win, not only yeah. do you get to make new connections, but then also you might be able to expand in your operation yep. too. Excellent. Okay. Well, I think um, we're wrapping up here. We're out of time for today's first um, broadcast. So Ben, thank you so much yeah. for having us out to your farm, taking your time. Ben's got some spraying to do, so we will not try <laughs> to keep you too much longer. So thank you very much. Yeah, happy. And yeah. Uh, thank you all your viewers for being with us today. Great. Thank you. Great, right. thank you, Ben, Holly, and Kristen. Uh, please feel free to continue posting comments and questions uh, after this video has been posted uh, and one of us will be sure to reply. Uh, in two weeks, join us again as we discuss soil health concepts with a Todd County farmer, Eric Stelling. Uh, thank you again for attending Fridays on the Farm and see you in a couple of weeks.